All right, thanks, Rusty. Um, and uh, as Rusty said, I do have a lot of experience in wetlands and uh, wetland restoration. I'm a wetland ecologist and GIS guy, mapping guy by trade, so I'm not an entomologist. Uh, I know more about the beetles than uh, any other insect out there, but I cannot answer direct entomology questions, so I know who can if you do have those and uh, you can shoot them my way. Uh, just a little about this particular webinar. Uh, this is part one of a two-part webinar that we're going to do about the beetles. Um, basically because there's a lot of information to get through. Uh, we do a workshop uh, typically a few times a year in the southwest uh, that's an entire day about beetle information and this particular presentation is uh, about an hour and a half intro uh, condensed down um, for this webinar and then the next one I will be talking uh, about the impacts uh, effects that we're seeing from the beetle uh, and some of the uh, environmental interactions uh, with wildfire with the uh, endangered southwestern willow flycatcher and things like that so I did watch as people were logging in saw some familiar names uh, if you've been to one of our webinars uh, this will probably mostly be a review for you uh, the next uh, webinar that we're going to do or I'm sorry if you've been to our workshop the next webinar we're going to do uh, will have a lot uh, more uh, information that's come out in the last couple of years as far as what the beetles are doing across the landscape. Uh, so this uh, will be just an introduction and we're going to start talking a little bit about uh, what it is that the beetles uh, were released for um, originally and of course that is uh, to provide another option for tamarisk management. Uh, if you were here for the first webinar that uh, we had in the series, Kara gave a really nice overview of Tamarisk, and I'm just going to highlight a couple of things and maybe add a little to that uh, because there's a lot of misinformation out there about Tamarisk itself. Uh, it is called salt cedar uh, because if you ever have an opportunity or have not yet in your life, break a piece of tamarisk off some time and uh, take a little lick and you'll see that it's pretty salty. Uh, this is because it has a mechanism to actually extract uh, salts from the water in the soil so that it can use the water and then it excretes the salts on its leaves. Uh, big misconception though is that tamarisk likes salty soils and prefers to grow in salty soils. Uh, this is not true. Uh, growing in a saline environment is a stressor on the plant. Um, so the sandier the soils, uh, the more stressed the plants are. Uh, this will come into play in uh, part two's discussion of some of how the beetle is interacting with tamarisk. Uh, but those salts are actually um, excreted out of the leaves uh, and deposited on the surface of the soil. Um, if extremely salty soils if the sunlight catches the trees right it looks like little diamonds or full-size salt crystals on the leaves themselves and of course it's a prolific seeder uh, there's some information from a professor in Kansas that it may seed as much as a million seeds per plant per year one thing that gives it a real advantage over most of our native species is that it can remain underwater for long portions of the growing season uh, Typically, uh, the root crown of plants needs oxygen to survive, and even our uh, wetland species cannot usually survive more than 30 to 40 days uh, in a flooded condition, and tamarisk can do much more than that, and send roots down extremely deep into the water table, uh, which allows it to spread into areas that are not typical of regular native riparian areas. Um, you can kind of see from this figure that uh, conceptually tamarisk spreads across the landscape and does not just stay in the riparian corridor that uh, we often see and uh, can create its 
own corridor of sorts. Uh, some research by uh, Dr. Manners out of Dinosaur National Monument found that the trees could accrete soil uh, that was in the water column and gather that soil and its branches and continue to grow. They actually dug down and found root crowns that were buried 15 to 20 feet um, below the current soil surface. Uh, so the plant can actually narrow uh, waterways by aggregating soil and um, creating land, dry land, basically. Uh, here's a historic photo uh, from the San Rafael uh, in Utah. Uh, you can see the old car going over the bridge there with those uh, stone pilings. Uh, those same stone pilings are circled in red on that lower photo. Um, so you can see how much Tamarisk has changed and narrowed uh, the river system here. And of course, it grows in massive monocultures that are difficult to manage. Uh, when we typically use something uh, like herbicide or grazing or fire or mechanical removal uh, to manage species, uh, they're on a smaller scale than this. When you have something this huge, it makes it really difficult to uh, to capture the entire width and breadth of what's going on in any kind of economical way. Uh, so this guy came into play. So here's a shot of a tamarisk beetle. Uh, you can see down there in the lower picture, uh, the beetle next to a dime, uh, which kind of gives you some references to size. Sorry, turn my camera off there in case I have some bandwidth issues. Um, and what the beetle was introduced for was uh, what we call a biological control. Now, a biological control is basically trying to uh, restore more of a natural state with um, to kind of develop this uh, plant herbivore interaction that doesn't exist. Uh, one of the reasons tamarisk does so well in the United States is there aren't really any native uh, insects or disease or anything that utilize it. So there's nothing to keep it in check. Uh, what biological control is intended to do is to uh, reestablish that relationship so that we uh, have more of a natural process of herbivores feeding on a plant and potentially controlling it. Now, biological control is never intended to completely eliminate a plant. It doesn't really make sense from a, a biological standpoint to eat yourself out of house and home. Uh, but it is intended to create um, more of a uh, stasis in the environment so that there's an opportunity for other plants to uh, live uh, with tamarisk. Uh, one of the, or some of the reasons that tamarisk was a perfect uh, potential species for biological control is that we have nothing native in the family of tamarisk in the United States. Um, Biological controls are very specific, often down to uh, species or subspecies. Uh, it's very difficult for something that feeds on a particular species to switch to a different species. Um, even more difficult to switch to a different genus and, and pretty much impossible to switch to another family. So very good uh, for potential of staying focused on the target species. Uh, the Environmental impacts um, from agriculture and other things were considered very strong. It wasn't considered to have a very good economic value, and uh, there were lots and lots of specialists that feed on tamarisk because of its unusual chemistry. So overseas explorations began in uh, 1987 and found more than 300 species that specialized on tamarisk. Um, of those 300, uh, three in particular uh, were designated for further study because of the impacts that they seem to have. Uh, and all three of these were approved for release in the United States. 
So this is a tamarisk weevil, uh, the tamarisk beetle we see, and a mealybug. Now the diarabda carinulata, uh, at the time it was considered that there was only one species of tamarisk beetle because they hadn't been really studied overseas. Uh, so that was what was uh, designated for approval. So to kind of give you an idea of what approval takes, um, of course they have to find a species that feed on uh, the target that is being investigated. Uh, they worked with a lot, the USDA worked a lot with overseas uh, scientists and specialists to look in different areas to find these. Uh, then they go through years of host specificity testing, which basically makes sure that those particular chosen uh, biological agents will only feed on the target species. They won't feed on any native plants. They won't feed on any crops. They won't feed on um, any landscaping plants, but they're just on that target species. Uh, then it has to go through a technical advisory group approval uh, before it ever goes into any kind of field cages uh, for testing. Uh, and then approval for limited open release. So those first releases were done on the Humboldt River Basin in northern Nevada. Um, and you can see here an area of pretty extensive uh, tamarisk defoliation. So they started to go out and uh, collect these tamarisk uh, once they had about 40,000 acres that had been defoliated. So they would go out and uh, sweep net them and bring them into the lab uh, in cages, get about and phrase and sort through them, count them out and send them out for release uh, in different parts of the West. Uh, they were first released here in Colorado uh, with the assistance of the Colorado Department of Ag by Sparky Tabor. And uh, in 2005 was the first time that we had the beetles uh, released here in Colorado. So a little bit about the beetles themselves. Uh, tamarisk beetles are a leaf beetle. Uh, I don't know if you remember back to grade school or maybe some of you have been home teaching your kids this the last couple of months, uh, but the most numerous animals in the animal kingdom are insects. Uh, the most numerous insects are beetles and the most numerous beetles are leaf beetles. So there are uh, thousands of kind of leaf beetles uh, around the world and all of them focus on particular species. I uh, just had some contact last week from someone in Denver wondering if they had tamarisk beetles uh, in their house and uh, they were actually elm leaf beetles, which is this guy um, up here in the top that looks very similar to a tamarisk beetle. So the, Tamarisk beetles are those two there on the left side of your screen. Uh, those other four are different. Um, Trirabda, elm beetles, uh, viburnum beetles, that all look similar. Uh, so elm leaf beetles are the ones that are most often confused. They like to overwinter in people's houses and come out in swarms in the spring, uh, which apparently they're doing right now in Denver. Uh, so lots of other similar beetles, but if they're uh, feeding on tamarisk, uh, they're tamarisk beetles. If they're feeding on something else, they're some other kind of leaf beetle. Uh, so to give you kind of an idea of where the beetles came from, uh, there are five different species uh, in Eurasia and Northern Africa, and four of these uh, have been introduced here in the United States. Uh, so these populations were all sampled by partners we had uh, have overseas and uh, were brought to the U.S. Uh, to give you kind of a general idea where the northern tamarisk beetle is currently the only one that is in the Colorado River Basin. Uh, the subtropical beetle has spread uh, throughout the Rio Grande and Pecos drainages. Um, the larger and Mediterranean are in northern Texas and there's a population of Mediterranean in northern California as well. Uh, but for now anyway, the only species we have uh, in the Colorado River Basin is the northern. New Mexico is the only state in the nation that actually has all four species of tamarisk beetle present in the state. Uh, they are doing some hybridization, uh, which is 
being studied by a few different groups uh, here at CMU and Palisade and Sector in the University of Idaho looking into uh, kind of what what that means uh, for the future of beetles here in the U.S. as they spread. So beetles have three stages of larva um, that feed on the tamarisk uh, and then drop down into the soil to pupate and become adult beetles uh, before they disperse. Uh, a general lifespan of the beetles is uh, roughly six weeks uh, here in our latitudes, uh, we'll, we have typically three generations, two to three generations of beetle a year. Um, as you go uh, farther south, you can get more generations. Uh, the beetles used to be defined, the northern species, any the one here, anyway, the one here was defined where it could go um, by day length. Uh, we've now seen from uh, research uh, by Dr. Bean out of Palisade and Sectory that the beetles in the lower part of the Colorado River, River Basin have evolved beyond that and are no longer controlled by day length. Uh, and whereas we used to only see beetles out into uh, late August, um, they're now out as long as November uh, in the lower Colorado. So the larvae are the ones that really do most of the defoliation and feeding on the leaves. Uh, the adults will feed some, but are mostly just looking to mate and keep the populations going. Uh, so we see uh, on this graph here, the yellow bars are adults, the gray bars are larvae, and the green bar is the canopy greenness. And you can see that uh, the defoliation and the plant um, dying back, or at least looking like it's dying back, is caused by the larva and that uh, all of that feeding that they do. So once the larvae feed and completely defoliate, uh, they drop down into the litter, um, pupate, and then the adults climb back up the trees and fly off looking for new green tamarisk. Uh, if they don't find new green tamarisk, they'll die. Um, so they are going around looking for uh, chemical cues called phenolic compounds. Uh, once they find these chemical cues for individual tamarisk plants, they land on them and begin to feed and release their own chemicals called pheromones that call in as many other beetles uh, as catch that chemical scent. Uh, as they feed on the plant, it stresses the plant, so the plant actually produces more uh, phenolic compounds. So there's this huge chemical wave in the air calling beetles in to these mass aggregations where uh, you can have thousands or tens of thousands of beetles uh, breeding and creating, you know, thousands, maybe millions of larvae that need to feed and then fly off and find new food. So this is actually currently happening uh, in Imperial National Wildlife Refuge uh, down in Southern California and Arizona. Um, the beetles are what they were doing in the Colorado Moab area 12, 13 years ago. Just massive swarms, clouds of beetles. A lot of recreators are complaining about all the beetles landing on them um, because they're looking for tamarisk that they can't find because they've eaten everything on site. But again, even with all those beetles in the air searching for tamarisk and and decimating when they find it, uh, they will not eradicate tamarisk. Uh, they will establish uh, an ecological relationship that we, well, most scientists feel one day uh, will reach some kind of balance uh, where we get cycles, uh, almost like the predator-prey cycles of rabbits and coyotes you uh, learned about as a child, uh, where we'll get very big beetle populations that knock the tamarisk back to almost nothing. Uh, the beetles will move on, the tamarisk will come back and repeat. Um, the expectation is that uh, eventually some kind of uh, stasis will be reached where tamarisk is in the environment, it's just not uh, dominant like it is now. So the beetles will move 
uh, as I mentioned, all I mean, anywhere looking for green tamarisk. Uh, this is three different years. Uh, the numbers you see across the graphs are river kilometers on the Dolores. And you can see that in one year they uh, were heavily downstream and then they basically abounded in those downstream reaches and moved upstream the following year. Uh, so once you have beetles, it does not necessarily mean that they'll stay in large numbers. There may be a couple around, but they will move all across uh, the landscape looking for green tamarisk. And they can move uh, a lot of research by um, Levi Jameson has shown that they can move up to 30, maybe even 40 miles a year um, as large populations. Um, and some of that research he did uh, through Marble Canyon. Um, and this particular graph is just to show you that wherever the beetles end up when they uh, drop down into the litter for to hibernate for the winter, uh, which is called diapause, uh, when they do that, uh, that is indeed where they uh, come back out the next year. So where you have high beetle populations one year, that is where they will emerge the next year. And if they have hit the tamarisk particularly hard and really knocked it back, um, it's possible that they're going to emerge in an area that has very few tamarisk. Um, so that they will uh, basically die off because they have no food. So as far as how they move across the landscape, when they do, they they can move in small groups um, or they can move in very large populations that decimate a landscape, uh, well, decimate appearance-wise um, a landscape within a week or two. Uh, all the brown you see in this picture is dead tamarisk, all the green is live willow. Um, but you can see this dramatic change on the landscape and can happen very quickly. And they can also expand very quickly. So that little city you see up there on the corner is Moab. Uh, this is some release sites uh, just down from the city. Releases were made in 2005 and by 2006, a thousand acres had browned. But by the next year, you can see additional flags. There are markers scattered across the landscape. 10 times that much uh, had been browned. And this is the Colorado and Green River systems. And over the next five years, uh, a combined 1.6 million acres of tamarisk uh, were browned. So once the beetles really start moving in large population numbers, uh, they can have a dramatic effect on the landscape. They can move pretty quickly um, and have a pretty big effect. Um, the One of the things that was noted in the original release permit uh, was that the beetle could not be released within 200 miles of a known nest of a southwestern willow flycatcher in Tamarisk. Uh, like I said, round, round two of the webinar, we'll get into what a lot of what those implications are. Uh, but the point I want to make is that with the release permit, it was assumed that the beetles could not move very far, very fast. When they had moved in Nevada, in the beginning, they were moving maybe two miles a year. Uh, so with a 200 mile buffer, then you've got 100 years to figure out uh, an overlap if it happened with an endangered species. But the beetles, once they were uh, along the Colorado River where there were just massive monocultures of continuous tamarisk, uh, we found that the beetle could move, as I mentioned, 30 to 40 miles a year. And over the years, uh, have an effect that looks like this. Here's another shot, uh, actually just down from Moab, the original release site. So you see it's a pretty big change, but the tamarisk do refoliate. Uh, we call it poodling because it looks like little poodle tails uh, coming back. Uh, and there are some areas uh, along the river north of Moab where the beetle has been for 
almost 15 years now that uh, the trees look basically just the same. Tune in next week or uh, next time for more on that. So as far as the populations, uh, as I mentioned, there there's this expectation that they will rise and fall as the food source rises and falls, and that is what we have seen. Uh, here's some data from uh, quite a few sites that the Colorado Department of Agriculture has in Western Colorado, and uh, you can see that there in what is that 2014. There's basically no beetles found, uh, and very few in 2015, and then the populations rebounded and, and came back again. We also saw the same trend uh, in monitoring up near Dinosaur National Monument, uh, within the monument, where we get cycles of high populations and then low populations. So, uh, a lot of this is, of course, based on monitoring the beetle, seeing where they go, and when when they move. Uh, so in 2007, uh, Rivers Edge West worked with the Department of Agriculture uh, in uh, Palisade and Sectory, and also uh, scientists out of UC Santa Barbara to develop a landscape scale monitoring program focused uh, on the Colorado. It, it has since spread beyond that. But back in the beginning, it was all about getting out on boats, going up and down the river, and uh, catching and recording beetle populations to see where they were moving. Uh, I was pretty excited when I was in my interview for the, my current position that I knew about these trips and I was gonna get to go out on the river and catch beetles. And that was the year the program changed and we moved more to a partner base. So I've actually never been out on a uh, beetle collection river trip, uh, but it, they look like they were fun. Uh, so this started our first annual map uh, in 2007 of where the beetles were found across the landscape. Uh, the one dot you see over there near uh, St. George, uh, was an intentional release, uh, not natural movement once the beetles uh, had been released here in the Colorado River system. Uh, we'll get more into that uh, on part two. So the colors here represent population size. Uh, this will change as we move on, but and many of you may have seen these maps, but we're, we'll power through them here so that you can see how quickly the population of beetles expanded across the landscape. So red are large populations uh, out to yellow, which are smaller, and then white where no beetles are present. And I'm just going to uh, thumb through a few years here uh, to show you the beetles. Uh, so all of this expansion was once the beetles had been introduced to that area, this is their movement naturally up and down uh, river corridors and tributaries. So you can see that it expands, uh, the beetle expand all across. Now they didn't fly over uh, the Rockies there. They were actually introduced by the Department of Agriculture here in Colorado uh, in the Arkansas basin and began to spread there. So this uh, color series that's gonna happen for the rest of these uh, is just kind of chronologically based. So uh, the red part of the rainbow spreading out uh, is years. So you get to get an idea of what movement they made across different years. Uh, and here where we see the uh, Texas data coming in, not sure it's switching, there we go. Uh, they did not just jump to Texas, they were release in Texas. This was 2012, it was just the first year we had data uh, from Texas. So one thing you can note here in 2013-14, uh, the right there kind of a line from the bottom uh, tip of Nevada over to Albuquerque is the furthest south that the beetles are. And that was true for a few years 
before in 16, they kind of jumped that boundary and headed farther south down, down the Colorado. So as the beetles spread and moved uh, throughout the west, uh, we saw them, the populations greatly declined. You can see all those white dots in Oklahoma and Kansas. Uh, we had a lot in Texas too. They just kind of disappeared. Um, Kansas had a huge wind event uh, that some of the biologists there say they haven't seen beetles since. So they may have literally been blown east of the Mississippi and are, are just no longer there. Uh, these are, uh, this is through last season's data. And you can see uh, we got a point actually down in Mexico uh, and below Oregon Pipe National Monument. And we have no idea how that point got there. There's current DNA work going on that population now to see where they might have originated. So this is a diff different view to show you where we had uh, reports of beetles last year. Um, as I mentioned earlier and showed you on the graph, we get these cycles of large populations and small populations. Uh, last year, these were the reports where we had really large population uh, expansion and numbers. This was the first time since 2013 that we'd seen large numbers of beetles in Texas. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens this year and see if they uh, spread out from that back into some of those uh, areas we'd previously found them. And these were the two main new populations last year. One in the Verde systems, the first time the beetles had been found in the Verde in Arizona. And then that one I uh, pointed out in Mexico down below Oregon Pipe. If you want to poke around and take a look at the beetle data yourself, we do have an online map uh, where you can go and explore your area, zoom in, um, copy the data and do whatever you would like with it. Uh, that you can access this either directly through ArcGIS Online or if you go to our beetle map page on our website, there is a live link to it there. And you can cruise around and look at it there um, or just look at it on our page. We also help develop an expert panel report that talks about what the future of the Colorado River Basin in particular looks like with the beetle in it. Uh, this can also be obtained on our website. And with that, I think I'm finished. Um, so I guess Rusty or Kara, if you got any questions for me. If they're about impacts and stuff, again, I'm going to refer you to uh, tune in next time. Thanks, Ben. Uh, just a reminder, if you guys have any questions for us, please enter them into the chat box. Uh, just click on the little bubble icon in the top right hand corner of your screen and just type us those uh, questions and we'll, uh, we'll get some questions answered. Uh, ben, uh, one has come in. Uh, this is from Justin Musser. Uh, I see potential for perceived property damage from things like increased soil erosion, even outside release areas. Have there been any issues or concerns with liability and how are those concerns being addressed? Um, I haven't heard, there are definitely concerns, but I have not heard of any actual action that has been taken on anything. Uh, one of the bigger concerns were from municipalities along the Rio Grande and New Mexico who were worried that uh, because the trees were dead, they would start falling out of the banks and during large flood events, potentially uh, build up bridge pilings and take out bridges. Um, we have not seen anything like that happen. Uh, the only uh, material I have heard about of being in the river is been purposely introduced to the river. Uh, we did have some concerns from some folks who'd had NRCS projects done. Um, 
again, mostly from New Mexico, uh, where some of the uh, water control structures had been anchored uh, with tamarisk, and there were concerns that if the beetle came in uh, and the plant eventually died, that uh, those structures would fail. I've, that was a few years back, and I, I've not heard anything from that. Uh, the only other concerns that I've heard about are mostly to do with animals, whether it's wildlife or livestock. Uh, there was some concern from folks in eastern Colorado that if they lost their tamarisk, their cows wouldn't have anywhere to go during large snow events. Um, and another there that has a, a world-renowned trophy archery ranch for whitetail. And uh, he was fearful of losing cover for his deer because uh, he lost all, all his uh, Arkansas river water, so he has nothing to grow new species if the tamarisk dies. Um, but the beetles haven't done much there, so nothing ever came of that. But those are the only specific concerns I've heard uh, outside of, uh, there's a different species of tamarisk called aethyl that's a much larger like shade tree. Um, and the Union Pacific and Southern Pacific Railways use it as a wind block. And a lot of golf courses in California use it as a landscape tree. And so there's been concern that the beetles might defoliate and kill those uh, and potentially cause issues. Uh, but they're very large trees and uh, I don't think they would ever die from the beetle. But there's the, about all the concerns I could think of. I haven't heard of any beyond that and I haven't heard of any litigation uh, aside from, from the lawsuit uh, that was brought against, uh, against APHIS over the endangered species. But I haven't heard of any kind of private landowner or municipal litigation or anything. Uh, we have a couple more here, Ben. Um, yep. Have we ever registered or known any uh, damage or presence on non-target plant, non -target plants, uh, uh, specifically Frankenia species? Uh, so any other uh, known non-target damage by tamarisk leaf beetles other than tamarisk? Sure. Uh, so Frankenia is actually the only species that was found in testing that the beetle would uh, consume. Uh, it's a mostly California native species. Uh, and when basically force fed it, the adults would eat it, but they do not recognize it chemically uh, mm -hmm. as any kind of food source and they will not lay, they won't lay their eggs on it. Um, so they will eat it, but uh, the larvae are the ones that really do all the damage and they won't lay eggs on it. So there never be larva on it and they don't recognize it chemically. So um, there appears to be no way in the natural world for them to ever use it. Um, and that is the only species in the United States that they could get the beetle to eat at all. Um, now, a lot of people I've heard that they're like, well, the beetle could evolve to eat something else. Um, that could possibly be true, I suppose, but there is no, the, the setup for evolution doesn't really work in this situation because there's no need for them to look for a different plant. They either have their food source and they eat it or it's not there and they die. So there's no generational opportunity to change and evolve. Um, and as I mentioned, there's just, there's nothing in the same family. So uh, it's, it would just, I'm not gonna say it would be impossible, it would be virtually impossible for a beetle to uh, recognize and eat uh, anything else. In fact, the northern tamarisk beetle won't even eat tamarisk parviflora. They do not chemically recognize it as a tamarisk plant. The Mediterranean beetle will eat it, but it doesn't appear to do very much, um, very much damage to it. Uh, but the northern beetle won't even eat that other species of tamarisk. 
All right. Thanks, Ben. Uh, we have a couple more. Uh, this one, um, uh, Eric Reckel, is there a plan to get rid of, of the Tamarisk uh, brush? Uh, maybe I'll address what, or, or Eric, if it maybe, maybe clarify your question. Um, we definitely identified Tamarisk as an impact to, uh, to, to River Health and, and as many of the things that uh, um, Ben presented in his uh, presentation, we, we are actively working on control of, of Tamarisk in, in lots of areas, uh, both uh, biological, biological controls, chemical controls, mechanical, cultural. Um, so there are, uh, you know, uh, the, the control of Tamarisk is woven into lots of uh, riparian restoration plans. But if you have a more specific question, Eric, uh, just, just shoot us one over. Um, ben, there's one here from Mark Flowers says, uh, Tamarisk is present in the St. Vrain River Basin, um, which is uh, a part of the larger South Platte Basin on the Eastern uh, Plains of Colorado. Are there any plans for beetle release up there? Um, I think, well, I do not know of anybody that has made direct requests from that. Uh, if you contact uh, the Palisade and Secretary with the Colorado Department of Agriculture, uh, they will uh, collect and bring beetles over uh, to the Front Range. They've been working uh, in the Arkansas Basin for many years. Uh, not entirely sure why they haven't established there. Uh, there's a possibility that it has to do uh, with the ant populations over there. Um, beetles don't have very many uh, predators here. Birds don't particularly seem to like them very much, um, but spiders and ants uh, will eat them. And if you have large ant populations, it, it, uh, they can eat all of the larvae. Um, so there's a theory that maybe that's it. There's some other theories about uh, possible herbicide usage. Uh, there's some conservation districts over there that discourage the beetle and encourage herbicide and that Maybe there's some drift um, taking out beetle populations because the beetles are very, very sensitive to any kind of chemical. Uh, so the opportunity for them to spread and move up north naturally um, just hasn't been there. The populations just aren't getting that big. Um, but I, and I haven't heard of any up there, but I'm sure that you could talk to the Department of Ag and, and see about getting some introductions if you have a, a appropriate site. Okay, thanks, Ben. Uh, this one's from uh, Laurel. Once Tamarisk uh, can uh, consume an area, could they be mechanically removed or burned before new growth restarts, or would they come back anyway? Um, so I'll talk a little more about this next time. But the beetles, if the beetles really like regrowth, if they stay in the system, um, that's kind of the catch. They can fly and leave at any time. But if you do have regrowth and new starts, uh, the beetles really seem to prefer that fresh new shoots of tamarisk. Um, but it's, it's one of those things like the beetle is just another tool in the toolbox and uh, they can help and add two things, but I, I would not rely on them to, to remove your tamarisk for you. And they're, never going to do anything with the standing dead. And um, so that's a, yeah, it's kind of a land owner management call, I guess. Okay. Um, so uh, Ben, maybe you could give us a short version, but it says, uh, how is the situation with the endangered flycatcher bird species? I, I would assume the question is based on the interactions of uh, the introduction of the tamarisk leaf beetle and the uh, flycatcher species. Is that for the next webinar or, or I don't know if you can give a short version of that? Uh, yeah, I was definitely gonna talk about that uh, pretty extensively in the next, uh, but the short answer is if, as I was saying, the beetles move around uh, and their the timing and frequency is uh, completely random um, just where they move if they happen to coincide with 
nesting uh, fly catchers, uh, then they could definitely impact um, the survivability of the, the chicks. The, and we've seen dramatic decreases of uh, fly catcher populations when beetle defoliation has occurred uh, at the same time as, as nesting. But uh, we've also seen those populations rebound or some others not be affected at all. Uh, so I'll go go into that a lot more next time. But uh, in general, yes, they definitely impact uh, nesting uh, if they're present when the birds are nesting. Um, and they will have a greater impact on populations uh, where the only plants available are tamarisk and there are no other uh, natives in the system where they can nest. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks, Ben. Um, just so you guys know, we're, we're just going to continue to try to get answers to these questions that are in the chat box. So we're, we're just gonna continue to plug away. There is a recording of this. So if you do want to kind of um, hear the, the question and answers, uh, please, please revisit the recording. So uh, the next one, uh, two-part question from Beth. It says, uh, due to the quick growth of beetle populations, is this the bad thing? And then the next part of that was, what efforts are being made to remove tamarisk, uh, the tamarisk dead plants and what is being planted? Um, I'll just quickly address the second part of that. Um, Beth, we, we, we do um, actively work with land managers and landowners uh, to, to remove the standing dead tamarisk plants or even the very, very weakened tamarisk dead plants that uh, have been defoliated by the tamarisk beetle. Um, one of the critical components of our riparian restoration work is the revegetation and reestablishment of, of native species. Uh, so um, it, it really depends on where we're talking about um, it, as what is being planted. Uh, so if we're talking about uh, the Arkansas River in the eastern plains of Colorado, it'd be very different than, than uh, what the plant, uh, the suite of plant species would be in, in, in western Colorado. But active revegetation is a critical component of our work and our partners' work. And so we, we dedicate a lot of resources to being planted. And usually we try to work with uh, native grasses and forbs and, and shrubs to get uh, reestablishment of, of, uh, of a native suite of species. Um, so we try to do our best with that. Um, but I don't know if you want to talk about uh, the rapid growth of beetle populations, Ben, and, and, and its impacts a little bit. Sure. Uh, well, it's kind of the same uh, thought as what happens with removal and replanting is a lot based on the land manager. And I would say that uh, whether or not the beetle expanding quickly is a good thing is, is also based on the opinion of land manager or those involved. Uh, people that have been struggling for years uh, trying to control large tamarisk populations uh, with herbicide and mechanical use um, want the beetles to expand even faster than they're expanding. Uh, there are people in Arizona that every time I see them coming down they want me to smuggle in beetles. Um, so those folks are really want them. There are a lot of people on the uh, wildlife side that are just looking at uh, tamarisk as structure, and that if the tamarisk is gone and and nothing else is put in its place or able to um, or able to grow because of current hydrologic conditions, uh, then the beetle's a bad thing. Uh, so. Yeah, I think it's just all about your perspective, whether or not uh, beetles spreading quickly is good or bad. I think from kind of the general management approach of how you want to go about doing something, it might be better if they spread more slowly so that you could keep up with removing uh, dead or dying tamarisk and, and replacing versus uh, say land manager like the BLM along the Colorado and in, in Utah that all of a sudden has you know, 10,000 acres of dead or dying tamarisk that uh, they're supposed to manage. Um, so I think it's just a thing of, 
uh, what your perspective is on whether or not getting rid of tamarisk in mass is a good thing to begin with. Yeah. Okay, Ben. Um, we do have several uh, um, uh, researchers and scientists on with us. Uh, thank you, Amanda, uh, for Amanda Stalky, who's uh, studying on the hybridization and the choice and behavior of, of Frankenia. Uh, we look forward to those results. And uh, Tim, Tim Graham is with us, uh, one of our partners uh, down in the Moab area. Uh, very good point, Tim. Uh, he, he did bring up, uh, uh, you know, addressing the question about removing defoliated tamarisk. Um, back to my point is, yes, we work with landowners and land managers to remove the uh, standing dead tamarisk if it poses, uh, we'll say, a problem of uh, aesthetics or in, in you know, hampering uh, recovery or, or access. You know, there, there are many reasons that we might um, remove defoliated tamarisk, but there are compelling reasons why we might not remove uh, standing dead tamarisk. Um, and, and Tim Graham came up with a, a lot of good uh, reasons for that, that it, it does uh, provide a structure and, and, and resting areas and branches for avian species uh, that carry seeds and, and, and may help to reestablish uh, native species in, in amongst the standing dead. Uh, there are other uh, mammals and 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 herptofauna that could use uh, those stands uh, for for cover. And so, you know, it, just because there is standing dead tamarisk doesn't mean that it it must be removed. Uh, it just depends on the land land use and and I think the land managers and and land owners' goals. So, thank you, Tim, for, for uh, clarifying some of those things. Um, Jim Hook said, uh, I've had good luck with masticating um, after the tamarisk is mostly dead. The downside is invasive plant here on the San Juan uh, would be the, uh, the Russian knapweed coming in behind and, uh, and, and really kind of taking over the understory. Um, that is true, Jim. Um, one of the things that we uh, are, are well aware of and plan for in most of our restoration plans is if you remove the tamarisk, whether, whether it's standing dead or mostly dead or even live tamarisk, uh, there will be secondary invasive weeds that come in behind. Um, white top prickly lettuce, Russian knapweed, there's a whole host of herbaceous secondary weeds that we plan into the cycle of our riparian restoration. Um, so, um, there are techniques that, that we've tried, uh, like, like thinning and, like you said, um, partial clear out, um, maybe even leaving, you know, some of the canopy there. Uh, some other reasons for that is if you clear cut everything, you know, that kind of reduces the microclimate and the humidity that might be useful to reestablish native plants. So, uh, good, good point on that. So. Yeah, and actually, um, uh, well, just to follow up on that even a little more, the, the BLM on the Dolores was doing for a little while what they called a 50-50 treatment, where they would go in and okay. remove basically 50% of the uh, standing dead uh, tamarisk, and they would do it in corridors big enough to get a four-wheeler down with a sprayer. Uh, so that they could continue to go in and treat for those secondary weeds. But in the process, they also planted a bunch of natives. And uh, the first year after planting, they had something insane, like 90% survival. We all thought it was kind of a fluke. And then the second year, uh, it was still in the 80 to 90% survival for the natives they planted. Uh, so they're definitely... I mean, this is, I, I call the beetle the largest ongoing environmental experiment in the world. And, uh, and there's lots of things that people are trying uh, that work and some that don't. But I, I think that that is a, a good option if you have it and can manage your land that way to actually, as Rusty said, provide that microclimate for your young native plants and still be able to take care of your secondary invaders. Yeah. Uh, Brian, uh, thanks. Um, he's curious about hearing more about post-beetle treatment options such as mastication, uh, uh, 
description of fire, biomass removal. Um, Brian, yeah, uh, we hope to continue these webinars. Um, Ben's going to have a, a next version of this. Um, you know, we possibly will have a, a webinar that's focused on restoration resources that really, I think, gets into some of those techniques, um, the tried and true techniques, some maybe experimental. So uh, look forward to kind of providing that information as well. Uh, Sally Thorson said, is there an ecological relationship between tamarisk and Russian olive? And can you man manage one without considering the other? Um, so I, I'm not aware of an ecological relationship per se of tamarisk and Russian olive. Um, they are uh, um, both from, uh, they, they do overlap in their native ranges. Uh, but there is no, um, what I would say, any symbiotic relationships that we know of, and I'll uh, defer that question to, to Ben or any other staff that might know. And we uh, do very much consider managing a whole host of invasive or non-native species when we go into a restoration. And my earlier comment is tamarisk, Russian olive, uh, Tree of Heaven, uh, the Siberian and Chinese elm, uh, just to name a few of the kind of non-native, uh, uh, in, in invasive, uh, aggressive, invasive, invading trees. And again, there's a whole host of herbaceous species that we deal with in the in the greater Southwest that needs to be considered when we do restoration, and there needs to be resources put towards controlling those. But um, I guess the question is, any ecological relationship that we know of between Tamaris and Russian olive, I guess, any staff that might know of that? Yeah, not, the, not that we know of. Um, I think uh, they're both excellent invaders and so often co-invade together. Um, but I think that um, Russian olive probably has the the same issues of uh, legacy depleted soil and uh, higher salinity and things like that coming in uh, behind tamarisk depending on the site but they definitely don't seem to help each other out in any way i think ben's breaking up um um well, uh, I think we will, uh, that is all the questions that we have in the chat box. Again, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. If you have any further questions, uh, you can email Ben uh, or any of the staff on our website. Um, most of the information that Ben presented, you can find links to that on our website at www.riversedgewest.org. And we appreciate you listening in. Thank you very much and have a great day.